The governor's big play in this legislative session is a plan to eliminate single family zoning statewide. If it's passed, cities will sue and they will have the governor's own words to use against him. The cities say the bill violates local control. Our Steve Steger found the governor once made the same argument to o limit oil and gas development. This is far beyond just a local problem. The governor's been arguing for his land use bill since the state of the state address this and winter. We need more flexible zoning to allow more housing, streamline regulations that cut through red tape. Senate Bill 213 would do a lot of things. Among them, it would set new zoning standards for cities across the state. Some city governments aren't too keen on the state trumping their own zoning codes. There's no need to throw out 100 years plus of home rule uh, and local control. Kevin Bomber with the Colorado Municipal League is actually making the same argument the governor made eight years ago. I mean, I had forgotten completely about it until I read it. Back in 2015, the oil and gas industry was suing the city of Fort Collins after FOCO residents passed a moratorium on oil and gas drilling in that city. At the time, Jared Polis was a congressman representing Fort Collins and filed an amicus brief in that lawsuit. He argues 85 years of Supreme Court jurisprudence supports a local government's ability and responsibility to enact zoning codes and land use ordinances that fit their needs. A local government is elected to represent its community members and is ultimately responsible for preserving the character of the community, he wrote. Local governments are best suited to meet the unique land use needs of their community through transparent processes. It literally makes the argument for home rule and local control of local land use policy as good or better than anyone has done thus far in the Senate Bill 213 discussion. The governor's office told us today the governor's statement back then was specific to oil and gas, not a blanket statement on home rule, saying the governor supports homeowners' rights, whether they don't want an oil pad near their backyard or if they want to build a granny flat on the back 40. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if a brief like this is cited in Senate Bill 213 litigation if uh, it contains unconstitutional preemptions like it does right now. So the bill had its first hearing last week, and it was one of the longest hearings at the leg legislature so far this year. Hundreds of people lined up to testify. There may be amendments coming in this case, but the governor's office says that this is a case of state and local concern. Can't be solved by a single local government, which is why, Kyle, in this case, the state has to step in and set the rule, but mm -hmm. you imagine a lot of city governments where people can actually go and testify before their city council if they don't like something are going to get involved in this. So I guess my question is, like, is, is the governor's position on this now, because people can change their minds on things, is his position on it now consistent? Say, like, like if I wanted to build a mother-in-law unit in my backyard and then also an oil rig and have my mother-in-law work on the oil rig in my backyard, is he okay with that? I don't know if your mother-in-law would be okay. Sure. With, uh, but Governor Polis' office told us today that if somebody wants an oil pad in their backyard, they should have the ability to have that oil pad. That, And if somebody wants to build an ADU... A yeah. granny flat in their backyard, they should be able to do that too. This is the end of the game of political twister in which the remaining players are bent over backwards and sideways <laughs> and so forth. Interesting story, Steve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A string of racist threats made against Colorado's first black congressman is leading to felony charges now against a man from Denver. The feds say that he warned Representative Joe Nagusi he had an AK-47 trained on him. Investigators say 59-year-old Michael James Kennedy left at least 17 threatening voicemails with Nagusa's office. When he's questioned by Denver police, Kennedy said he only tried to scare the congressman. He wasn't going to shoot him. Kennedy was arrested last Tuesday on two felony charges. Court documents indicate that these racist threats are something of a hobby for him. That Kennedy has left those kinds of messages in the past for other Colorado Democrats, including Mayor Michael Hancock, U.S. Representative Diane DeGette and Governor Polis. Denver School Board Vice President Ayante Anderson is avoiding the possibility of a second censure by his peers for now. The board decided not to discuss it as planned last night. Anderson was previously censured for his online flirtations with a 16-year-old girl. At last night's meeting, every board member except for Board President Sochi Gaitan voted to take the issue off the night's agenda. Gaetan is accusing Anderson of violating board policy by talking about confidential board meetings following the shooting at East High School that left two administrators injured. 
The board decided instead to spend most of the meeting last night discussing school safety and not Anderson's actions in the aftermath of the shooting. Anderson has called the attempt to censure him an act of anti-blackness. A DPS spokesperson says the effort to discipline Anderson could be discussed at a future board meeting if the president decides to put it on the agenda. A Republican state representative with a history of racist and offensive remarks at the state house was back at it again today, comparing people with disabilities to the people who get injured when they choose to run with the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. The comment came as the House passed a Democrat-backed bill that expands legal options for disabled people who are discriminated against in public spaces like restaurants, hospitals, and libraries. The bill would make it easier for a person with disabilities to file a civil lawsuit in these discrimination cases. Only one Republican representative, Larimer County's Ron Weinberg, voted for that bill. Other Republicans said that it was just meant to enrich injury attorneys. Representative Richard Holtorf of Akron suggested today that people with disabilities are somehow responsible for their disabilities, likening them to the people who get hurt during Pamplona's running of the bulls. The running of the bulls in Pamplona, it's a beautiful thing. But you know what they don't do in Spain? If you're dumb enough to get on this road and run, the eight blocks, ten blocks, and, and run in the ring, and you get hurt, you own it. And that's Spanish law. There's no liability, there's no lawsuits, you don't get to do any of that because you're responsible for the risks that you take in this running of the bulls. The bill's sponsor, Democratic Rep. David Ortiz, who uses a wheelchair, called Holtorf's comments ignorant and ableist. Holtorf's foot and mouth disease is a pre-existing condition. Last year, he was forced to apologize for a racist comment calling a colleague buckwheat during a floor debate. The same year, he suggested the state senator Tom Sullivan, whose son was killed in the Aurora Theater shooting, need to quote-unquote let go of his son's murder. After Holtorf's comments blaming people with disabilities for their own situations, House Republican spokesman Roger Hudson said that both sides got emotional during the debate. And he referred to Holtorf as a statesman. 80-degree day in Denver today. Guessing the last thing a lot of people were thinking about is snow. But the snow has been fantastic across our state this year, and soon it'll start to melt. Some places are already preparing for the possibility of dangerous flooding as a result. Mark Salinger takes a look at why this year's snow melt could be making an impact for years. Miles away from a nearly empty reservoir, the mountains above Lake Loveland predict what's coming soon. We're in dire need of uh, snowpack to replenish those reservoirs. People in the city of Greeley rely on Lake Loveland for water. It's also crucial for farms and agriculture across northern Colorado. And right now, it's 70% empty. And we're expecting in the months ahead that that's going to come down and refill reservoirs that were depleted by drought in a pretty hot summer last year. Sean Chambers is the director of water and sewer utilities for the city of Greeley. The snowpack graphs he looks at show the reservoirs won't stay empty for long. We're about 115% above average here on the Front Range in the South Platte Basin. And that puts us at about 135, 140% of where we were last year. So what do all those numbers actually mean? There are some years where Lake Loveland doesn't even fill all the way up after the snow melt. This year, Sean is focused on making the most of the water in a year when we actually have it. So replenishing our storage is really critical for uh, being in a resilient position to survive the next drought cycle. For years, Colorado has struggled with drought. That makes all that snow up in the mountains now that much more important. We, we absolutely need the water. Uh, we just are really worried about how fast it comes off the mountain. In Delta County, Commissioner Don Supis is warning his towns to prepare for flooding. If the snow melts too quickly, he says they could be in big trouble. And we are we are very nervous about the amount of water that's going to be coming down our rivers and streams in the next month and a half. Every year we suck water out of places like here in Loveland. This year, the water that fills it back up could help us survive the next drought. But we expect with this snowpack that we'll refill the reservoir. So remember the Cameron Peak fire from back in 2020? Water managers in Greeley are still dealing with its impact. In recent years, they've had to shut down the water treatment plant because the water was so polluted with sediment from the fire coming down from the mountain. This year, they'll monitor the runoff for impacts of the fire, but they're most worried about heavy spring rainstorms washing more of that dirt and debris into the rivers.
We're now a decade off of that enormous flood event for northern Colorado, uh, Boulder County especially, in 2013, flooding that led to a lot of mitigation work and hopefully prevention work for the future. Yeah, Sean was talking about that today with me. He was saying that they've increased the infrastructure. They've made that better since those floods way back in 2013. Now it could be put to the test if there's this massive snowpack and then if we also have a quick snow melt. Don't say way back, Mark. That makes some of us feel old. It's just <laughs> 10 years. It's just back, okay? It's just back. Thank you. The Biden administration wades into the debate over Colorado River water conservation, then stops short of deciding which states will have to make the biggest cuts. And a shiny surprise for park rangers the day after Easter. A million colored plastic and paper confetti pieces. Not a fun cleanup. Next. The Biden administration is putting off a decision on competing conservation plans from the states and tribes that rely on the Colorado River. The seven river basin states have not been able to come to an agreement on how to make the drastic mandatory cuts required. The majority of the states, including Colorado, say the bulk of those water usage cuts need to come from the lower basin states, Arizona, Nevada, California. And the upper basin states are saying that should only happen if critical reservoirs hit catastrophically low levels. But California, biggest user of water from the Colorado River, is not on board with this. California's leaders want to protect their senior water rights, and they've indicated that they will sue to protect those rights if the federal government doesn't rule in California's favor. The Interior Department's released an environmental analysis of both of the plans, but is not taking a stance. They say they want the states to consider their report and try to come up with a consensus on their own by the end of May. If there's not a consensus by then, the feds say that they'll make a final decision, like they were supposed to earlier. We're keeping an eye on a small fire going in El Paso County, just west of the Air Force Academy. The Rampart Fire was first reported this afternoon. Firefighters say it is at least 20 acres at this point, and there's no containment. People who live south of Woodland Park were briefly told they needed to be ready to evacuate, but then those pre-evacuation orders were lifted. We'll keep you updated on air and on 9news.com if anything significant changes with that fire in El Paso County. There are still people evacuated down in Los Angeles County in southern Colorado. The Sheriff's Department says a fire there has burned at least 100 acres just southwest of the town of Aguilar, about 30 miles from the New Mexico line. People living within a three-mile radius of that fire aren't allowed to go home. The heat and the high winds certainly not helping firefighters out there. Today was a record breaker here in Denver. Previous record, 80 degrees. That was last set back in 1982. Today, we topped off at 85 out at DIA. A degree warmer in Fort Collins and Greeley. Look at Ray, 90. Lamar, 90 degrees. 50s, 60s, and 70s up in the high country. And we're going to be watching that snowfall melting and melting fast. Bright and blue across downtown Denver on this Tuesday evening. The winds have been kicking up pretty much all day long, especially off to the eastern plains. 20 to 30, 40 mile per hour wind gusts. And unfortunately, they're going to continue for the next two more days. We have red flag warnings back at it again tomorrow, noon until 8 o'clock tomorrow evening for the far eastern side of the state. And then this is going to scoot in a little closer to the I-25 corridor. Looking ahead toward Thursday, the Denver metro area, and then stretching all the way across the northeastern plains, we'll be looking at that fire weather watch for wind gusts upwards of 45 miles per hour. It's pretty quiet and calm otherwise, as this ridge of high pressure is just kind of sitting atop Colorado, keeping the storm track to our north. The good news is we do have some moisture that will be moving in by the end of the week. We just have to get through the next couple of days of heat and strong winds and high fire danger before some of that rain and snow returns. Tomorrow could be another record breaker. Certainly looks like it. 79 is the current record. Last setback in 2018. My forecast high of 84. Once again, a day in the 90s off to the eastern plains. A little cooler for us on Thursday, but the winds will be kicking up quite a bit. Then that cold front moves through 50 with a good chance for scattered rain showers, maybe a little snow mix in there. Not, no accumulation here in the city. And then we are looking pretty good for the weekend with the 70s back in action next week. The people who protect our parks say they welcome outdoor celebrations, but maybe everybody can leave the glare bombs at home. That's not really something that they should leave behind or even use in one of our parks. Happy Easter to everyone except the park rangers who have to clean it up. Next.
I hope you were able to get out somewhere over the weekend, Wash Park or elsewhere. It's just a, it was a beautiful Easter weekend to spend outdoors. I know you didn't leave a mess behind. That was some other people. What happened at Lair of the Bear Park in Jefferson County? It's a wonderful place for a celebration. It is beautiful. It's right by the creek. There's a lot of really nice, big, mature trees. We just don't like to see when people disrespect the area and leave a big mess behind. So one of our rangers, as we were on patrol, encountered a glitter, a lot of glitter in our picnic area at Lair of the Bear Park, and just wanted to let our visitors know that that's not really something that they should leave behind or even use in one of our parks. There might be a million colored plastic and paper confetti pieces in this park tonight. What a mess. So I think what happens is we've got a holiday and they use it to celebrate and then that glitter ends up on the ground and it's a lot to clean up. So a lot of times visitors will just leave it sitting there. And as rangers, we, we don't walk past trash. So we're gonna be there picking that up um, because it's not safe for wildlife too. Some animals find those little colorful things that might even smell like food. So they might try to eat it. We have no idea what that's gonna do in that animal's stomach. But also if you think about the visitor experience, none of us wanna to come to these beautiful places and see trash. So that really is trash. So leaving that behind, you're, you've trashed the park and you're making that a trashy view for everybody else. So I don't want people to think that this is a super common thing, but when we see it, it is disheartening. We would love people to celebrate. In fact, we know our parks are a place where people come to celebrate, but we do want you to celebrate in a way that is respectful to the park and respectful to the other people that are having their experience at the park. Park rangers are too polite to say this, but obviously celebration decorations just need to be handled like you do dog waste. Take that crap with you when you leave. Your feedback on the state rep who compared people with disabilities to those who risk getting injured running with the bulls. Next. It's a sign that you really ought to just stay put. Viewer named Jeff Smiley sent us this photo of a detour stalemate in Lakewood at Bear Creek and Estes. So for anybody who is walking or biking, you can't go left, you can't go right. Instead, you should go left or right. Maybe you should just stay or turn sideways and try to squeeze between the signs. If you see a sign that makes you do a double take, th those are actually pretty good. Email it to us at next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Comments this evening about Republican Representative Richard Holtorf suggesting that people who have disabilities are, are somehow alike those who, who run with the bulls in Pamplona, Spain and get injured. Justin writes in to say that the root of ableism is currently able-bodied people deluding themselves into thinking that it could never be me. Justin writes, it can, it will. Your flesh is my flesh, you will be me. Man named Skip Lonnie writes in to say, I have been in a wheelchair for the past eight years. I have a rare condition called cavernous mangioma, something I probably had since I was born. Skip writes next, I didn't have any reckless act or run with the bulls. But I think it'd be fun now that I'm in a wheelchair. You know what, Skip? Maybe Richard Holthorff would be willing to go with you. Just make sure he's behind you, okay? We'll see you next time.